With the day's first light, it begins. The quiet drumming of ball meeting pavement that echoes the compelling rhythm of a game and its dreams. There he goes. He goes in straight, goes up in the air. Now he's sideways. Look at the air. Look at With simple purity. Larry Bird shakes free. ultimate grace. It has woven a legacy that transcends time in its ability to stir the imagination. Basketball in its highest form. Right hand, 12 footer, good! HBO Sports presents History of the NBA. Whether it's played on the asphalt of the inner city or the well tended wooden floor of a professional arena, basketball is both sport and spectacle. Hello, I'm Pat Riley. Like the game itself, the history of the NBA is one of contrasting images. It's a story of both enduring tradition and remarkable, often breathtaking evolution. And as we marvel today at the aerial majesty of Michael Jordan, the ball handling magic of Irvin Johnson, and the uncanny instincts of Larry Bird, it's almost difficult to believe that it all began simply with a ball like this and a peach basket. <laughs> In 1891, Dr. James Naismith invented a new sport. A Massachusetts school teacher, he hoped to amuse his students during the long New England winters. The first professional teams rented out local halls and charged two cents for admission. The peach basket soon disappeared in favor of a rim with a net tied at the bottom. And with no rules on fouling, heavy pads became a necessity. The Roaring Twenties would see the game played on a court, surrounded by chicken wire. The players were known as cagers, and bouncing the ball off the sides was legal. The best teams took to barnstorming, hitting the road in search of better competition and bigger paydays. The premier team of the time was the original Celtics from New York, featuring the likes of Dutch Dennert, Matt Holman, and Joe Lapchick. They pioneered the use of a pivot man in the middle and introduced the zone defense as they won two professional championships in the late 20s. The 30s brought the onset of the Depression, but the game endured, finding refuge in dance halls like the one found in Philadelphia's Broadwood Hotel. I think the people would pay a dollar or a dollar and a half, whatever it was, and you'd have a basketball game and dance. And that was the original concept. It was one such establishment, the Renaissance Casino Club in Harlem, that gave birth to basketball's next great team, the Renaissance Big Five. Led by star big men, six foot four, Tarzan Cooper, and six foot five, wee Willie Smith, they dominated the barnstorming road despite often difficult conditions. The fans were sitting right on the floor almost. And one of our ball players by the name of Puggy Bell, one of our great ball players, he bent down to pick up a ball. And a woman came out of the stands and kicked him right in as you know what. At the Savoy in Chicago, promoter Abe Saperstein formed a rival team. Claiming that they too hailed from New York, 
He dubbed them the Harlem Globetrotters, hoping to gain instant respectability. But playing in such unorthodox places as a drained swimming pool did not help their cause. Although they won the 1940 World Tournament, they became best known for their comic antics. Eventually forsaking serious competition, they entertained audiences with the dribbling wizardry of Marcus Haynes and the irresistible clowning of Reese Goose Tatum. It was just naturally funny. Now, not only the crowd laughed at Goose, but the rest of us fellows would we liked him too, you know, we, we thought he was funny too, and he was. In 1949, Sweetwater would make history as the first black player to sign with an NBA team. But first, basketball would see many of its stars hitch up for military service with the outbreak of World War II. The NBL, the professional league of the time, continued to hold games, however, as fans squeezed into tiny arenas. The arenas were, uh, to call it an arena was really to to embellish it. Uh, we played in Sheboygan in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, where the stage was at one end of the gym, where you'd have to have uh, padding because you ran into the stage. In 1946 in New York, this would all change as Maurice Potoloff was selected to preside over a new 11-team league called the Basketball Association of America. Three years later, the BAA absorbed the NBL and the NBA was born. Its early stars were Joe Folks of the Warriors, George Mikan of the Lakers, and Bob Davies, whose Rochester Royals endured an 18-hour train ride to play a single game in Minneapolis. We'd hurry up and finish our game at 10.30, and they'd hold a train for us to New York Central Station in Rochester. We'd get into Chicago about 7.30 in the morning, have breakfast, and catch the Hiawatha to Minneapolis at 9 o'clock, get in there at 3.30, get something to eat quick, and go out to the uh, gym and play the game. Once there, they would face the NBA's version of Superman. And though he looked more like Clark Kent, George Mikan dominated the league in its early years. From 1949 to 1954, the Minneapolis Lakers won five titles in six years, led by Big George's overpowering inside play. They always say that I was very powerful underneath the basket. I was a pussycat. I would make uh, almost 50% of my scores on rebounding, offensive rebounding. Despite his soft-spoken manner, the 6'10", 240-pound Mikan was a physically overwhelming player who was impossible to guard. He was a difficult man to move, to budge once he got his spot. And uh, to play behind him was, was was death, I mean, you couldn't stop it. After winning his final championship in 1954, Mikan left the NBA on top, but not before, forever changing the course of its history. When George Mikan retired, the NBA lost its first true superstar. But Mikan's impact on the game would be felt long beyond his playing days. Ladies and gentlemen, the NBA's first great one, George Mikan. George, you were such a dominating player when you played that you actually changed the game. Then all of a sudden, they changed the game on you, didn't they? They sure did. The first rule change was the goaltending rule. I would go above the basket, either swat it away or catch it, come down and start the fast break. The second rule change was when they widened the lane underneath the basket from 6 feet to uh, 12 feet. One of the uh, most important rule changes was the 24-second shot clock, and it was because of that 19-18 to 18 game against the Fort Wayne Pistons. Would you talk about that? Well, the Fort Wayne team uh, uh, stalled on offense. They would not shoot. They would not uh, move the ball forward. And I'll never forget the game because uh, it was a father-son game, and the place was packed, and we were trying very hard to make a game out of it. And so uh, it came down to the final minutes. Uh, Larry Foss was the center for uh, Fort Wayne. And in the last play of the game, he went up, and I was told, don't follow him. Uh, we're one point ahead. He went up uh, for the shot. I went up to block it. It rolled off my hand, and it went in off of my hand. And did I get it from our players? Tell me about this. I know a lot of people would like to know. I would like to know. Why number 99? Well, you know, uh, 
I was never 100%. And I always liked the wholesale price of 99. <laughs> no retail? No retail. Well, I'll tell you what. You sold retail back then, George. You were great. Thanks for being here. In the post mike and years, the game style of play would change dramatically. And a team perfectly suited to its quickening pace would come to dominate the NBA, establishing a standard of excellence by which all other great teams would be measured. In the early 1950s, a flashy young point guard named Bob Cousy rose to stardom with the Boston Celtics. A ball-handling magician with a flair for the dramatic, Cousy would lead the league in assists for eight straight seasons. And together with sharpshooting Bill Sharman, form the best backcourt in the NBA. But it wasn't until the Celtics acquired the rights to one William Felton Russell that the most celebrated dynasty in all of professional sports was born. Well, I remember Arnold coming to me and saying, we're going to get a guy that's going to change everything for, for us. The shooters and the runners were in place, but obviously what he gave that supporting cast was the defensive backboard domination so that we could run out that fast break with complete reckless abandon. And, of course, he added the shot-blocking dimension, which we didn't even know we were getting. That was a bonus. Bill Russell made shot-blocking an art. 90% of the time when he blocked the shot, we would get the ball. And then, after a while, he became so intimidating. Uh, it was like blocking another 10 shots a game, even if he never touched the guy. A guy comes in, and you block the shot. And then you go down, and you get an easy layup. These things make statements. And then you, you might look at him and smile and say, yes, yes, we, we, we did that to you. I think Russell was the foxiest, smartest, meanest player uh, psychologically that ever played the game. Whatever it took to win, Russell would do. With Russell dominating at both ends of the court, the Celtics overwhelmed Bob Pettit and the St. Louis Hawks for their first NBA championship. I can remember playing against him in the fourth quarter, and uh, I went in for four layups in the fourth quarter. He blocked the first two, and I missed the next two looking for him. A year later, Pettit would have his revenge, as the St. Louis Hawks upset Boston in six games to become the new NBA champions. But for the Celtics, the competition was only getting stronger. With the arrival of Elgin Baylor in 1958, his Los Angeles teammate Jerry West in 1960, and Cincinnati's Oscar Robertson, the only player in history to average a triple-double for an entire season. But the one player who towered over all the others was Philadelphia's Wilt Chamberlain. He was just unique. Uh, there's not a player center playing today that could stop Wilt Chamberlain scoring. Unquestionably, the greatest offensive force the NBA has ever seen. Chamberlain would average over 50 points a game in 1962, including a record-shattering 100 points against the New York Knicks. But it was his one-on-one -on -one duel with Bill Russell by which Chamberlain's greatness would ultimately be measured. It may have been a duel for Russell to have to worry about trying to stop Will Chamberlain, but I had to worry about playing against the Boston Celtics. Though Chamberlain would routinely outscore Russell in their head-to-head -head confrontations, it was Russell and his teammates who would find a way, year after year, to win the championship, ultimately becoming the first and only team in professional sports to win six consecutive titles. I used to tell him, you're a world champion. You're a member of the greatest basketball team in the world. I said, isn't that a lot of fun? I said, so let's go out and get the job done. We got the, we got the players. Let's win it again. After coaching the Celtics past the Lakers for two more championships, Red Auerbach in 1966 lit his final victory cigar. All right, Casey with the ball. Gets surrounded. One second. That's it. It's all over. Havlicek got the pass, and he gets mocked. It's all over.
For the Celtics, it seemed as if the time to celebrate might be over. They were an aging team, and the powerful 76s were waiting in the wings. The greatest team, without a doubt, was uh, the Philadelphia 76s up 66, 67. I think our first 44 games, we were 41 and 3. With Chamberlain in the middle and a cast of all-stars surrounding him, the 76s would crush new head coach Bill Russell and his Celtics in the 1967 Eastern Conference Finals on the way to their first NBA title. The thing that I'll remember most is uh, being in convention hall. We lost uh, the series, I think, four games to one. And when they knew they had it in the bag, the fans start chanting, the Celtics are dead, the Celtics are dead, the Celtics are finally dead. But the Celtics were not dead. Guys like Satch and Havlicek, these guys wanted to win every game, every year. Relying less on talent than on desire, the Celtics would recapture the title the following season. But in 1969, a weary and often injured team faced nearly insurmountable odds, defending it against a Laker team with newly acquired Wilt Chamberlain in the middle. But these Celtics had pride and history on their side. I think probably subconsciously, uh, some of the players were probably were thinking about each time we played the Celtics, uh, wondering in their mind if they could beat the Celtics or not. I always thought that we could beat them. Uh, we didn't, but I always thought we could. Ironically, though Jerry West would be voted series' most valuable player, the 1969 finals belonged to the Celtics, who defeated a more talented Laker team with hustle, with intelligence, and in the final moments, the luck of a bounce. Of all the ones we lost, that was the one that really hurt the most. It was the Celtics' 11th championship in 13 years, an accomplishment so monumental that it left even Bill Russell, their elder statesman and spiritual leader, at a loss for words. Chris, I'm here with Bill Russell. Bill, this must have been a great win for you. Exactly. Bill Russell's Celtics were undoubtedly one of the deepest and most talented teams in NBA history. But perhaps the most amazing aspect of their incredible ability to defend their title year after year was their uncompromising will to win. Simply the greatest winner in the NBA, Bill Russell. Bill, year after year, championship after championship, the team had to find another reason to win. How did you do that? Well, it was a combination of things, Pat. For me personally, I wanted to win every game we ever played. Exhibition games didn't make any difference. Playoff game, we wanted to win every game. But uh, we were so close as individuals that we would do things like when Walter Brown died, in his memory, we wanted to make sure that he won a championship. Or when Cousy retired, we wanted to make sure that he went out a winner. Or when Red retired, we wanted to make sure that his last year was a championship year. And uh, we cared about the other guy's career. In fact, uh, we loved it when, like, Bill Sharma would lead the league in free throw percentage, or Kuz would lead the league in assists. Uh, the rest of the players, we loved that. Mm -hmm. was, it, uh, was it Red? Was it Red inspiring this, or was it the players themselves amongst one another that brought this out of each other? It was a combination. It was, we were a unit. It was not the coach and the players. Mm -hmm. We were a unit. And we were, we were in it together. That's why we were able to say we won a game, a championship for Red. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because he was one of us. What is it about the Celtic mystique? What is the Celtic mystique? Well, to us, there was no mystery. Uh, there was no mystique. We just went out and won ball games. <laughs> <laughs> all the time. Well, we tried. Well, like I said, uh, we, we tried to win all the time. Um, but I think that probably the... The one thing that made us win so consistently was we had players that understood the game 
and understood why we were winning. And so that when times come to win, if you know how and why you do things, you do those things. Well, you inspired a lot of us, most importantly me. Thanks for being here, Bill. Oh, it's a pleasure, Pat. In many ways, Bill Russell's retirement in 1969 marked the end of an era. The Celtic dynasty was over, and a new generation of imposing big men would now collide in the quest to lead their teams to a title. It was a time of titanic struggles. A decade when the weight of championship dreams fell more than ever on basketball's broadest shoulders. Willis Reed, the captain and driving force of the New York Knicks. In the 1970 finals, he would battle the legendary Wilt Chamberlain to a standstill but injured in the fifth game. Top of the key to Reedy's triple team falls down. We got a whistle on the play, and Willis is hurt. And sidelined for the sixth. His ultimate test came in the deciding game, a test of courage. As a little boy growing up in Bernice, Louisiana, I daydreamed about playing in the NBA and winning a championship. I knew one day I would be here, and how would you look back on that? How would you feel? Did you ever want to be a person who could say, I wished I had a try. Oh, here comes Willis. And the crowd is going wild. Though barely able to walk, Willis would do more than just try. We are playing against the greatest center of all time. And you're going to try to do it on one leg. Down court to Frazier. Got it by West. Left side of the lane. Outside Reed. Jumps from 20. Yes. Inspired by their valiant captain, the Knicks stormed to their first championship. For Wilt Chamberlain, the 70s was a time of change. From his first days in the league, he had been basketball's most devastating offensive weapon. During my time, they knew the ball was coming into me. They would put two and three guys in that position before the ball even came to me. I would love to play right now. Otherwise, I honestly think that if I played right now versus my time, I'd average 70, 70 points a game. Though still one of the league's most prolific scorers. In the 1972 season, Chamberlain would expand his role. Me, they went to for the points, they went to for defense, they went to for rebounding, they went to me assists, they went to whatever the game asked, they went to for me. You know what they didn't go to me to shoot the technical foul. Sorry about that. Chamberlain's Lakers would reap the benefits of his metamorphosis. They would run off a record 33-game win streak en route to capturing L.A.'s first title. Hello. Lakers, the all-time consecutive game winning game. But as Chamberlain gloried in the twilight of his career, a new star was rising. He presented to me for the first time in my career of basketball a guy that I felt that I really needed some help to guard. A young Kareem Abdul-Jabbar had teamed with Oscar Robertson in 1971 to lead the Bucks to a title. I thought Kareem was the best. I thought no one, no one could handle him. But though he had earned a championship ring in Milwaukee, he had not yet reached the pinnacle of his career or found a permanent home. It would be a trade to Los Angeles that would allow him to do both. Being able just to be where I wanted to be really made me feel kind of liberated. And uh, I think I responded in, in the way I played that. Statistically, that was my best year of my career. Joining the Lakers in 1975, Jabbar would now begin his reign as the NBA's most dominant player. The thing that amazed me the most about him uh, in that initial meeting was his, was his strength. He's just an incredibly strong and powerful performer. Perhaps the greatest challenge to Jabbar's supremacy in the middle came from fellow UCLA graduate Bill Walton. 
It was a, a, a very competitive atmosphere when I, when I played against him. I thought uh, when he was healthy, he was definitely uh, one of the great centers to play the game. Overcoming two years of injuries, Walton led his Trailblazers to a dramatic upset in the 77 Western Conference Finals. In the finals, Dr. J and the 76ers would also fall victim to Portland's playoff magic as Walton and the Blazers triumphantly capped their Cinderella season. In the 70s, the road to the finals was a bruising one with Goliaths like Nate Thurman and Artis Gilmore roaming the paint. The battle under the boards was at its most ferocious. Eight different champions would arise in the decade, and even the presence of a perennial all-star such as Bob Lanier in the middle did not guarantee a title, as every team seemed to possess an intimidating big man. For six-foot-nine Dave Cowens, this meant a constant battle for survival. It was one he waged with furious intensity. Uh, there were some pretty rough guys out there who you knew you were in for quite a game every time you suit up against a particular team. The way I played the game was just play it as hard as I could all the time, no matter who I was playing against. With his unquenchable competitive fire, Cowens propelled the Celtics to championships in 74 and 76. Mirroring his indomitable spirit was another undersized center, six foot seven Wes Unsell. A merciless adversary, he would lead the Bullets to their first championship in 1978. For 48 minutes, you and I were going to knock heads. If you had something weak about you, I was going to exploit it and make it weaker. They give it to Dennis Johnson. He'll spin the left side to the corner. Long jumper off the back of the rim. Unsell, the long rebound. Shovels to Dandridge. The Bullets are going to win. Washington, D.C. has a major sports world champion. Of all the heralded big men that rose to prominence in the 70s, one would transcend this golden era of centers. Continuing to excel as his contemporaries retired, he would go on to rewrite the NBA record books, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Kareem, like George Mikan, Bill Russell, Will Chamberlain before you, you were the focal point of your team, yet it seemed as though you were immune to the pressure. How did you endure 20 years of being immune to that pressure? Geez, that's, that's hard to figure out sometimes, uh, and I did it, right? Um, but it's, um, I think it has to do just basically with the way I approach my, my life. And I saw that uh, it was a great professional life, and if I prepared myself, I could enjoy it for a while. Mm -hmm. And I just dealt with it year, one year at a time and uh, didn't get caught up in what it all meant. Because uh, everybody wants to talk about what it means, uh, but for the person that has to do it, you have to go out there and perform. And I just uh, tried to apply myself to that and uh, not worry about the other things. Obviously, you endured very well, but uh, there were a lot of opposing centers who did not endure very well the, what I consider to be the greatest weapon in the history of sports, Cap, the, uh, the sky hook. How, when, and why did you develop that shot? Well, when I first started playing uh, basketball back in the fourth grade, uh, that was the only shot that I could shoot that didn't get smashed back into my <laughs> face. And uh, trying to keep my face in one piece became a priority. So I, I worked on it, and uh, I was very fortunate to get good coaching along the way. Uh, my high school coach, uh, Jack Donahue, really encouraged me to shoot it. He said, get as close as you can and shoot it. Um, John Wooden uh, also told me to use it, and he also uh, had me develop uh, other shots to complement it uh, to make sure that they couldn't uh, overplay the hook shot. And it really gave me a nice, versatile uh, offensive game. And, I was able to use that uh, very well, as you know, in, in the professional ranks. Why don't they emphasize it now? Why don't coaches teach the skyhook to players? I think it's really hard to get uh, someone excited about being a center. Everybody wants to, to face the basket and go to the hoop with the, the beautiful athletic moves of someone like uh, Michael Jordan or uh, Julius Irving, uh, which is really poetry in motion, as we all know, and have uh, been in awe of. But uh, the, the game on the inside is a little bit more stationary and not quite as exciting to watch and uh, young people really don't uh, 
gravitate toward that type of play right now. Well, you shot it well, Kareem, and you did it better than anybody in the history of the game. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. Every team in the NBA searches for a dominating big man, but there's another type of player whose distinctive style makes him equally vital to the game and to its fans. With every spell-binding move, with every heart-stopping play, they will take your breath and challenge your imagination. Here he goes, he's gonna drive. Come on, Jordan, fly. Here he goes! They are basketball's virtuoso performers. They are the showmen. From the league's earliest days, they've basked in the NBA's bright spotlight. Earl, top of the key. Monroe drives, shoots. Oh, what a Never failing to delight their fans. Never ceasing to amaze them. They clear out. He's isolated on Roundfield. Oh! Shot by the Dodgers. He takes it left the lane and beats Jordan. Michael steps in. Reverse layup. Oh! oh what a shot! Michael Jordan! The league's pioneer showman first took center stage in Boston Garden. As the Celtics piled up championships, Bob Cousy brought flair to the NBA. It's entertainment. We're all, in that sense, if we're honest with ourselves, I suppose we're all kind of show-offs in, in the sense that, you know, we want to display our skills, we want them to be successful, and, uh, and we want the appreciation of the audience. Like Cousy, the cast of innovative performers who followed him would draw inspiration from their audience. So the fans always, they always get you going. You know, it could be because you're an entertainer in, in, in all senses of the word. Uh, it, it's, like a, it's like a performer, like Michael Jackson might perform differently for, for different audiences because uh, the audience brings a different element out of it. Three seconds, plenty of time. Oh! One of the things I learned early um, in my career, even in college, was how to play to the crowd. And it was very important to me to have the crowd on my side because, you know, it, it just made my juices flow. When the pearls' juices flowed, the spectacular usually followed. The things that I did on the court, a lot of times they were instinctive, but at the same time, I basically knew exactly what we were doing. For big men, the standard of basketball artistry was set by Connie Hawkins. I established my style probably after playing with the ABL and then got to the Globetrotters and uh, learned how to do a lot of dribbling and, and controlling the basketball. The Hawk took front court showmanship to new heights, but it would be another high-flying forward who would truly bring aerial acrobatics into vogue. With a basketball in his prodigious hands, the doctor seemed unbound by physical law. I never went into a game saying, well, I'm going to do this tonight. When the openings came and then the daylight came, you know, I'd just do it. I mean, it, it was not a risky shot for me to go in and dunk the ball backwards. The Julius for a slammer. As great as Julius was and all the amazing things he did, there's somebody who's taken it a level above that, a fellow by the name of Michael Jordan. I think a showman is a person who uh, enjoys the game, and you can see it through their play. Jordan. Oh, my! An entertainer is that type of a person who wants to go out and entertain. Wow. Though Jordan rules the airwaves, on the ground, the Showtime throne belongs to Magic. Six. 
while you're playing. But perhaps the most sensational showstopper of all was Pistol Pete. Maravich was unbelievable. I think he was like sort of ahead of his time in the things that he did. An electrifying performer, Maravich routinely did the miraculous. He could do things with the basketball that I've never seen anybody do. And no one since has done them any better. Best showman of all time. Ooh. I'll probably have to say Pistol Pete. In every player who knows the thrill of bringing the fans to their feet, his legacy lives on. Though their personal styles have varied, what Pistol Pete and his fellow showmen have always shared is a unique approach to the game. With me is Bob Cousy, and Bob, it was said back when you played that you were not considered just the best of the best. You were unique, and what you did, nobody else could do. But where did you get off when everybody else had to be fundamental that you could be a showman? Well, what I was was probably the biggest show-off out there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, you, you want to be an exhibitionist, I guess. We're all aware we're, we're, it's the entertainment uh, business as well as winning and losing and uh, I had you know a lot of God-given talent that I complimented I suppose with a vivid imagination but perhaps the most important thing is both on a college level and a professional level I had a coach who said hey go do it uh, as a coach I talk a lot about uh, this fine line between pattern and spontaneity how much did Auerbach talk about that well, Al Beck was never an X and O guy, so if we never ran any pattern, any half-court set, uh, but focused completely on a transitional game, he was happy. That puts the points on the board, and it gives you the best selection in terms of shots. So, and he was a showman as well, uh, you know, that whole cigar stick we all remember well. <laughs> and so he related to that stuff. He knew that you had to win, that's the way to get people in, uh, but you had to do it in an exciting and a spectacular way. Uh, of all of the magnificent moves, was there anyone in a big game that backfired? Oh, God, we don't have enough time, Pat. How, why do we have two minutes here? <laughs> no. Anytime you're, you're focusing on unorthodox maneuvers, you know, a lot of them not going to work. The, the thing to remember if you're an athlete is, you know, not to be insecure. And just because a couple backfire, it's like shooting. You miss your first five, the shooter goes after the sixth and seventh immediately, and passing is the same thing. Don't be inhibited, and don't be frightened by throwing a few away, because eventually your talent will come to the fore. Well, Bob, obviously yours did. Thank you for being here. Of all the magnificent showmen who left their mark on the NBA, few have had a greater impact than a charismatic young point guard by the name of Irvin Magic Johnson. In 1979, he would make his highly publicized entrance into the league, and along with another heralded rookie, begin to dramatically reshape NBA history. Who could have imagined that in this house in Lansing, Michigan, a young man named Irvin, and in a sleepy town in southern Indiana, another youngster named Larry, would grow to have their adult lives so inextricably linked. Their first meeting would come in the 1979 NCAA Finals, where Larry Bird and his Indiana State Sycamores faced Irvin Magic Johnson's Michigan State Spartans. Scoring 24 points, Magic would lead his Spartans to their first national championship. Round one was his. But it was only the beginning. The very next year, Magic would find himself in the NBA Finals, playing three positions and scoring 42 points. He would lead the Lakers past the 76ers to win the championship in his rookie season. Since I've started, I always thought about winning first, not just out there to score points, not just out there to put on a show, but to win. And when Magic hit the floor, he takes no prisoners. In 
1982. Magic would lead the Lakers to another title, igniting them with his passionate play. He still uh, is an enthusiastic player, and that, that is one thing that uh, won't change about him. He plays with a lot of emotion, a lot of heart. Loose ball with 15 seconds, and Johnson has it, and he throws up a foul! And he does! <laughs> Meanwhile, Larry Bird was forging his place in Celtic history. Seven minutes left. Larry Bird. Bottles his own shot. Oh, what a point. Leading Boston back to championship glory in 1981. I felt that basketball is a game where if you just stick to the rules and play hard and dig down a little deeper, nine in, nine out, you're going to come out on top. Bird gets it back. Saves it. There's a lot of players in this league that can score uh, the first three quarters of the game. But you get down in the fourth quarter when you need a basket, you can separate the men from the boys. And it's been like it ever since I've been in the league. Pass to double team and Bird. Larry, fake, fall away. Hits it! All right! Their NBA championship showdown would finally come in 1984. And Larry Bird was determined that this long-awaited rematch would belong to him. Ames finds an open bird, takes rampant. One second, it's not. Five years after their first confrontation. Here's Larry Bird, chucking down the court. Bird had his revenge as he led the Celtics to a climactic Game 7 victory. That man can play that game of basketball. I think the one key ingredient to, to making us each of us a good basketball player is that we come to win every night. The following year, it would be Magic's turn as the Lakers became the first visiting team in history to win a title in Boston Garden. Theirs was a rivalry that captivated the sports world, but as they ushered the NBA into a new era, another one was ended. In 1987, Julius Irving would bring his illustrious career to a close, but not before teaming with Moses Malone in 1983 to bring his 76ers a championship. The doctor would leave behind an emerging group of young superstars who would join Magic and Bird in reshaping the face of the NBA. the guys before them and made it a piece of the part of their game today, which is advanced basketball tremendously. And, and further down the road, you're going to see the same thing. And boldly leading basketball into the future will be Michael Jordan. Jordan on the move, in for the right, reverse layup. Oh! The ball beat the pressure. Jordan from Goodson. Look out. And Ewing wants the ball and gets it. But while Jordan may be the player of the 90s, the 80s belong to Magic and Bird. In 1987, the Lakers gained their fourth title of the decade, eliminating the Celtics in six games. But they would not stop there. And I'm guaranteeing everybody here, next year, we're going to win it again. True to their word, in 1988, the Lakers would defeat the Pistons to become the first team in 19 years to repeat as champions. Back to back! Yeah! Yeah! The following season, Isaiah Thomas and the Pistons would finally have their time overcoming two years of playoff frustration as they captured the last title of the 80s. But though new stars and new champions may emerge, none will leave a greater imprint on the game than two very different men who have shared a common passion.
In the 1980s, the NBA thrived as never before. But as the decade began, nobody could have foreseen the phenomenal renaissance that it was about to experience. And the reason? Irvin Magic Johnson. Irvin, you came into the league as a 20-year-old, wet-nosed rookie. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, did you ever think it was going to turn out like this? Did you ever dream it was going to be like this? Not out of my wildest dreams. You know, we're sitting here in these tuxes <laughs> and talking about the history of the NBA. Um, I just wanted to come in and win. And if uh, winning could bring me all this, then fine. But uh, I'm still dreaming. I'm still living that fairy tale life, and I hope I never wake up. There's an old saying that if you do more than you're supposed to do for somebody else, you get back twice as much for what you do. It seems as though that's been your attitude throughout your career. Explain that. Well, I got that thing from my dad. Uh, he instilled unselfishness and and to me and also my other brothers and sisters. And if you didn't get the message, he would take you over his knee and explain what he was trying to say. So he, uh, he just made me learn the game from both sides of scoring and also passing. And that's, he's the big reason why I'm the player I am today. Well, it's obvious that uh, you like to have fun, but there has to be one part of the game that is more fun than others. And what would it be for you? All of them. All, <laughs> all, all the of them. Uh, uh, the stinky sneakers, the, the crowd, the, the game, and also the main part is the, the competition, just competing every night against a great player or a great team. And this ball right here is, has done so much for me. Uh, not quite this one, though, that one, that <laughs> but good. the one that uh, we play with now. And, uh, I just love it, so I owe it all to this little round basketball. I tell you, people owe a lot to you, too. Thanks for being here. Thank you. With superstars like Irvin Johnson, Larry Bird, and Michael Jordan, the NBA possesses some of the most recognizable athletes in sports. But the richness of the game comes not only from its marquee players, but also from its intriguing personalities. It's not nice to be spying on people. They are full of surprises. What a hot dog move. Put a little mustard on him. I don't know what happened to me. It wasn't my fault. Rappy was picking on me. Tell him to shut up. They are calm, cool, and always collected. They are the NBA's colorful characters. These three don't look like the three stooges. I've never seen them. Have you ever seen anything funnier than that? And they are the undisputed favorites of the fans. You pay for that seat? All right, keep talking then. I just don't like to hear from the freebies. Well, you mentioned Frank Layton. It's funny. I mean, the guy's a funny guy. He's one of the funniest guys you could ever want to meet. I mean, uh, he's a sick guy to start off with. I mean, a drink of water? Okay, I taste it first. Do I taste it? Yeah. How do I know somebody didn't put something in it? You know what? Uh, there should be more fun. There really should. I think there should be more interaction. You know, sometimes you got to the fans. Fans are part of it. But the kissing bandit gave him more than he bargained for. Well, you know, he's not going to run away from this. <laughs> he rushed across the floor, and uh, she kissed me. It overwhelmed me so much that I passed out. All right, right before the game. Actually, when I first saw her coming, I hollered for the police. I thought someone had stole the ball back. This is a typical, a typical disgusting display. Oh, now the other Lord Fortnoy's coming in, the other good guy. Meet Celtic announcer Johnny Most. Well, Johnny was an institution. Uh, he was up there by himself, smoking cigarettes, drinking coffee, and every time we got fouled, we were killed. And we were mauled. Oh, the yellow, gunless way they do things here. He makes no bones about it. I am a Selick, and the other guy's a bad. They told me I shouldn't say bad things about Isaiah, and I say, why not? I thought it was hysterical listening to um, Johnny just recently doing that uh, McDonald classic. And the little guard, uh, Hubbardovich. 
Now it's McNeely to the big guy, and now to the lefty. And he lost the ball, but it's picked up in there. Now to the little fella. Oh, boy, I'm, I'm having trouble with the name. Then there was the night that I set myself on fire. <laughs> All right, Bird is putting the ball on the play. And I had a cigarette in my hand, and it fell right into my lap. Right on DJ, and DJ. Right around the zipper area. Oh, this my! This is the first. Johnny has slit his pants up on fire. <laughs> It was burning, <laughs> and Glenn was getting hysterical. He was laughing so hard. I was laughing hard. I was on fire, and we were as sparks were flying all over the place. We finally got it out. I had a hole, I swear, as thick as a baseball. Though he didn't use a microphone, Daryl Dawkins also had little trouble speaking his mind, especially about his favorite pastime. I had a, a turbo saxophonic delight dunk where I went up and swiveled the hips a little bit and kind of brought it across. I had the rump roasted bun toast and cake shake and baby making thank you well ma'am I am jam dunk. And I had the dunk called your mama and that was for anybody who jumped in front of me while I was trying to dunk it. I love Daryl's sense of humor. He added something to you every day. I mean, you never knew what was coming. Or what was coming down. I remember when I first said I wanted to break a back when I was in Philadelphia. And everybody looked at me like, he's got to be crazy. So when it actually fell, everybody was like, you looked around like, you believe what he just did? He just tore that thing. The glass was just flying everywhere. Now, I got to see if I can do this again. We were in Philadelphia. Doug Collins uh, comes Doug down Collins? with the ball. I'm pretty sure it was Doug Collins. Bobby Jones cut through. He dished it off to me, and I went up, put it back on the numbers, and came through one more time, and it came down. Glass started falling. I started saying, yeah, yeah, I dig it, yeah. But the commissioner stopped there real quick. But as always, Chocolate Thunder would have the last word. They seem to think I was going to come in the league and stay in for two years, but I fooled you. I stayed in 14, and now I got that good pension plan coming, and I ain't complaining about much. From its irrepressible characters to its relentless competitors, NBA history is a constantly unfolding drama. But through all of its passionate struggles, its glorious triumphs, and its stunning upsets, Perhaps what lingers most vividly in our memories are those few indelible moments that capture the imagination. And it is with some of these that we leave you. I think there will be a period of orientation for me, of course, like it is for every newcomer in the NBA, but I think in the long run, I'll be able to handle myself man to man with almost anyone in the league. are leading by one point. There are five seconds left. Johnny? Oh, I don't know. Greer is putting the ball on a play. He gets it out deep, and Havlicek steals it! Over the stand, Jones! Havlicek stole the ball! It's all over! Johnny Havlicek stole the ball! And... Now there's a steal by Bird! Underneath the DJ!
champion with an incredible upset. Bud Webb. 25 seconds remaining. He has only seven. Has to be 15. That's eight. Make it nine. And 10. At 11 as we're counting. 13. Huge rack that time for Bird. He's still got to drop one here quickly. 14. This is a tie for the money. Yo! The pressure shows. Ten with three seconds to go. Two seconds. One second. West throws it up. He makes it. West throws it up and makes it. The ball game is tied. Jerry West made it from the other side of the big coin strike. The inbounds pass comes into Jordan. Here's Michael at the foul line. A shot on Elo. Guys! The Bulls win! They win it! Set the Cleveland Cavaliers! has been a presentation of HBO Sports, the network of champions. The HBO original movie for April is a true story that could reveal the identities of a ruthless gang of killers. The investigation inside a terrorist bomb premieres Sunday, April 22nd on HBO. Catch the brightest stars, the biggest hits, the best movies on HBO. Michael Keaton, Jack Nicholson, Kim Basinger, one of this year's Academy Award winners, Batman, Eric Stoltz, Daphne Zuniga, a bright-eyed wonder discovers he's inherited his father's unusual traits, The Fly 2. James Woods, Sean Young, an uphill battle turns into a downhill race against time, The Boost. Coming up next, 
Jeff Bridges, Farrah Fawcett. From one marriage to another, see you in the morning. Catch them all, the best movies on HBO.